Hello and welcome to Good Journeys with Second Mountain, the podcast that shines a spotlight on inspiring people and their inspired stories. You can join in the conversation with us on social media using the hashtag Good Journeys Pod and find us on YouTube at Second Mountains, Second Mountain Comms. I'm your host, Ben Veal, founder of Second Mountain Comms, helping good people do good. And joining me today is my guest, George Ryan. George is the founder of Rainbow Life, a surrogacy agency based in New York State. With a bachelor's and master's degree in primary education, George was a teacher for many years, working with children in various settings. Yet his main desire in life was always to become a parent, which he finally achieved through surrogacy in Canada. When the COVID-19 pandemic took over our world, George felt the time was right for him to found a business focused on the areas of surrogacy and third-party reproduction. The idea for his purpose-driven business emerged during the pandemic, and now George is focused on sharing his love for family, passion for making others' lives better, and the joy of receiving the gift of surrogacy. George, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ben. That's always the introductions of a big bit to get through. Um, yes. And now I will speak much more naturally, but it's lovely to see you. <laughs> and thank you for joining us to, here on, on the Good Journeys podcast. So I'm really interested to um, learn more about the story that's behind you found in Rainbow Life. So, so what's the purpose of your business and how are you seeking to help others with it? Uh, well, the purpose of my business is pretty straightforward. As you mentioned, uh, it is surrogacy related. So as an agency in a surrogacy uh, field, we, we manage, well, we, we help educate people about surrogacy, about the benefits and uh, the process, and we help manage the process. Um, and it's, it's a quite a complex um, process, a procedure. Um, so it, it does need a bit of um, guidance and support. So that's our main goal. But um, I, I really love educating people on surrogacy, especially in New York. Uh, it hasn't been legal uh, for compensated surrogacy for a long time. So I feel there's a lot of education to be done in my state. Okay, so when did, when did that change? A couple of years ago. It happened um, exactly, <laughs> well, it was, it was announced like eight months before it became legal. Um, they had been working on it for years. Um, there was a law against uh, sur compensated surrogacy. Compensated is that, you know, you can pay uh, the surrogate for helping uh, gestate your child. Right. Um, so it was legal to non-compensate, um, but for obviously for a lot of women, that would be difficult to to go through that process without any financial support. So, so you mentioned oh, it, so it was it was legal, uh, or they had been working on it for a long time. They announced it eight months before it became uh, active, and then so it was. I believe it was almost a year into uh, the pandemic, so it kind of happened right at the same time. And so had you already, did you already have the idea for Rainbow Life forming beforehand or, or was it that change in legislation that really felt now was the time was right for you? Um, I had been considering working from home um, and surrogacy was not an option as a business previously. And so it was the law change that sparked that, um, that thought, yes. It was a long thought out process if I was going to do that or not. Um, it's a big commitment. Um, you know, I filed for a uh, corporation um, and you have to get licensed here in New York state. We're the only state that requires licensing. So I had to go through that process as well, along with all the other financials and business related um, learning I had to do. It's a steep learning curve, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Marketing, uh, you know, managing money and um, yeah, 
speaks a lot. How how have you found it? Um, well, I don't recommend people necessarily start a business with a with a toddler. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think it's a, a much more challenging time to do that. So it's been a slow process, um, but I am a persistent person and I care enough about what uh, my my hopes are that it's worth it. So, um, you know, to, to have, I can't wait for the time when I have a parent, you know, hold their child that they never thought they were gonna have before. So it's it's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me about what it was like to to launch um, and develop the business idea during the pandemic. Well, um, like a lot of people, I think um, I had big projects. I replaced the roof on my garage. Um, So I think a lot of people had time to think about um, their lives, what what needed to be done that didn't involve other people, (laughs) you know, a lot of self-reflection, you know, spending time with your family. And uh, so, yeah, it, uh, it kind of lent itself well, because I did have a lot of time to think about all those things that I needed to do and what was involved in starting a business and, you know, particularly surrogacy. It was the same for me. It's interesting. I, I'm sure we're going to look back on that period um, with us with a small sense of nostalgia, despite everything that happened at the time, because that was the only time for me in 15 straight years of working in communications when I finally had an opportunity to just pause and stop for a bit and mm-hmm. consider where I wanted to go in life, which was the impetus for my business. So it's interesting that um, I think the experience you've had myself and many others Probably exactly. that that four to six months of very strict lockdown was probably life changing in many regards. Right, and it was kind of funny because um, my son was born in January. Um, the pandemic kind of started in December, if I remember correctly, um, and then it came stateside um, not until like the spring. It started mm-hmm. blossoming. But I had been in self quarantine because I had a newborn. So it was kind of strange because nobody else was really, you know, into quarantining at the moment. Um, So I was staying at home. You were an early trendsetter, George. Exactly. (laughs) So I was experienced in quarantining already. So it was kind of funny. It was kind of funny, but not funny because I wanted to get out. (laughs) Because I was like, okay, you know, in my head, I'm like, I'm going to have time to get out with my new baby and see people and then it was like hmm I think it's going to be a little bit longer I mean nobody knew how long it was going to take uh and then all of a sudden I I came to the um the point where I was like I think it's going to be a while So so talking of things that are going to be a while um I know that the, the, the journey for you to become a father was a was a long and winding one. Um, can, can you talk us through that journey, the obstacles that stood in your way to realizing your dream of, of becoming a parent? Yes, so um, I'm a single parent by choice. So that alone has its uh, challenges for becoming a parent. Um, so I looked at different options. I believe my first journey into parenthood was possibly adoption from overseas. I think that was the first option. I worked for a, a multinational, uh, multi-corporation, uh, global corporation, and they had um, a program where they would reimburse some uh, costs of that uh international adoption or even domestic. Uh, And so I looked into it and it it wasn't easy for a single parent, especially a single male. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was my first challenge. And then there was domestic fostering and looking for domestic adoption 
through private means even. Um, and I had some movement forward and then, you know, in, in, in this area, you usually get pretty knocked back pretty hard. You know, it's emotional for mm -hmm. sure, but it's, you're involving other people and there's a lot of conflicting views or your paths are different. And so things happen quite quickly and, and pretty harshly. Uh, so it, it, it is a struggle. And for those that have infertility issues, um, it's very similar, but more dealing with their body. So their body isn't working the way they, they were hoping. And so it gets very frustrating um, for people that want to have children very dearly and they can't. It is, it is debilitating at times, mm. um, emotionally for sure. But even, you know, I wouldn't call it full on depression, but it's, uh, it's very similar. Well, I, I went through it. So I, 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 my first, um, you know, I've been blessed with two children. Um, but my, my first was eight, eight years in the making, um, ultimately, ultimately through IVF. Um, and well, you're it, very well aware. <laughs> I'm very well aware. It's, it's, I think depression is, is probably a very accurate term to, to place on it. It's um, incredibly hard. It's, this feeling that you are not in control, um, incredibly frustrating, incredibly sad, and just this feeling of absence, um, which is compounded by so many, uh, certainly at a certain stage of life, like like my wife and I were in our, in our mid to late twenties, compounded by all of your peers um, becoming parents. Exactly. And it's, it's very challenging. And so, yes, absolutely, I can, I can relate to that journey. Yeah. So I, um, I became a parent uh, older than 50. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm all my friends, even my younger friends had already had kids and, yeah. you know, moved on. And so here I am just starting. And it's, so it's, it's, um, it's daunting for sure. <laughs> how, how, how do your, how do your friends react? Because they're, they're presumed, you know, they're at a very different stage now. So they're presumably started to get a semblance of freedom and life back. And then here you are with a toddler. Yes. Um, well, the pandemic affected that as well. <laughs> um, so I didn't really get a chance to interact with my friends. Um, you know, like you would think, uh, or you would expect normally, um, yeah, I don't know. They're kind of living separate lives, really. Um, I'm I'm kind of on my own in that in that department. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's a it was a little isolating, despite uh, or in spite of the pandemic being isolating as it is. So it didn't really affect my experience too much, but it was personally on a personal level, it was it was sad that mm. I couldn't experience it with other people. Yeah, no, I can, I can understand that. Um, but, but you became a, you know, became a proud father to your son about two years, just over two years ago. Is that right? He's two and, half, yeah. two and a half. So can you talk us through um, what that experience was like for you? So firstly, going through surrogacy and secondly, what it was like when you finally held that child that you longed for for so long in your arms for the first time. So the surrogacy part of my journey to become a parent was about five years long. Um, not everybody has that experience. Um, so, and I, and I wouldn't call it average. It, it's probably a little bit on the longer side. So that's, that's difficult. Um, and again, like I said, you run into to other people and they have different ideas or they don't, their you know, thoughts are, or um, path isn't aligning, so you have to part ways. Um, so there was a lot of that. It, it was a lot of letdown. But um, I sort of changed a lot. So I have a clinic as well um, to create embryos. I have to go to a clinic just like a person with infertility. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a first clinic and it didn't work out. And along with a, a surrogate that didn't work out. 
so we had three failed pregnancies. Mm -hmm. um, so you're really excited on the first one and then you kind of get used to it a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, as used to it as you can be. So it's a little easier after the first time when you're like, I'm not gonna have a child. Um, so I just had a, an epiphany that I was just going to change everything. So I basically started over and that was a good choice for me. Sometimes people, you know, we have different decisions, but for me that worked out and we became, when I say we, I became uh, pregnant. <laughs> I became expectant. There you go. I became expectant um, within, I think it was uh, like three or four months. So it was pretty fast. Okay. And then obviously, you know, time start sticking from there. You got, you know, less than nine months because with IVF, you're already four weeks pregnant mm. <laughs> um, when it's confirmed. And uh, so I got busy getting started, you know, getting ready. And uh, oh, so, so the time came and it, it was on the west coast of uh, Canada. So I'm on the east coast of the United States. So it was pretty much almost the furthest you could go. So I had a long trip um, and landed in Vancouver. I had to drive for a few hours to even get to where I needed to be. It was the middle of winter, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> I went over a mountain that has a can't remember the name now but it it was dangerous <laughs> <laughs> or it could be dangerous but I made it and um so I got there a little early because she was experiencing um you know pre pre uh pre labor and so I decided to go a little bit early just a week ago and so I was there for a little bit while and we got to talk to each other before because, uh, uh, you know, being so far away, even time zones to, made it difficult to, to find time to communicate. Um, and uh, so once the time came, uh, I had a preconception about how I was going to behave uh, in the delivery room, but it didn't actually pan out that way. Um, so I had considered, I had considered my, um, I can be quite a crier and I thought I wouldn't be able to function, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it turned out that, um, the moment came upon me and I knew I had a job to do, right? I was the parent and I just, it was kind of like, uh, I was pretty serious about it and I got the business. I was just ready to go. And I just, I don't know, it was weird. It was like, uh, I had done it before. I don't know, it was weird. Mm. It is one of those strange experiences because I think you've- uh, Yeah, you never, you, you don't know until you get there. No, you don't. You know and, <laughs> and, and no one really has a clue what's happening. I mean, obviously you've got highly experienced midwives and, um, you know they have a good they know what's going on but but certainly yeah. uh, you know i felt pretty pretty useless both times trying to do the best i could in the situation but really you're you're there at the side aren't you um yeah, yeah. <laughs> doing the easy job um right right yeah i'm like <laughs> i i definitely you know her her husband was in the room as well um thank god it was pre-pandemic because she would have been either by herself or mm. or one person um but I was definitely glad I was in the room. But I think that is important. I got skin to skin time uh, pretty much immediately. Mm. Uh, and then they did the checks and see if he was healthy. Uh, and uh, yeah, we got our own room and uh, it was a, you know, <laughs> very nice moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember I remember that first night vividly with with well with 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 both of my boys, but certainly my 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 firstborn just just lying down next to him in, mm -hmm. in at night and just watching this tiny human being <laughs> just breathing ever so quietly next to me and just just this moment of awe, just thinking how how has this happened? How is uh, yeah? How is this real? It's it's um 
it's a it's a it's a pretty breathtaking experience seeing yeah it's funny time unfold. time doesn't uh there is no time because you know they're born whatever time of day is. Mm. and then they don't sleep regular patterns they sleep mostly but uh, when they're awake they're awake at weird times so it's this very euphoric uh yeah time where you just you're just it's you and, and your child you know so what's your fatherhood journey been like so far then? Does it does it marry up with what you were what you were hoping for? What it, what what have been some of the highs and maybe some of the things would have caught you by surprise? Um, as I mentioned a little bit, the isolation, um, partly due to the pandemic, but also because of my age. And also, I mean, any parent I think has um, has challenges with socializing um uh you know so i recently started going out with him in public um you know we've always gone to like the store obviously i'm a single parent so he has to go to the store with me yes but things that aren't you know required you know so we're having more fun uh out and so it's a little strange being a parent in public uh <laughs> I don't know if I thought about that before. Um, you get a lot of looks sometimes or comments. Sometimes I got a comment recently at a at a uh, Van Gogh exhibit. Um, it wasn't pleasant. <laughs> hey, really? And I did, yeah, and I didn't know how to respond, and so I took offense to it. Um, where I could have probably handled it a little better, um, but I was quite perturbed. That's a good mm. word. I was perturbed by by their comment. Basically, my son was having uh, a very good time, uh, and it's as I found out later, it was museum uh, museum <laughs> museum rules. So it's you know more library like. Uh, okay. So toddlers don't do that. They do not observe <laughs> these rules. Yeah. And they and the people that I talked to. You know, at the uh, at the that organize the events, they understand. That, you know, um, so basically, they were telling me that he was being too loud, and told me to do something about it. <laughs> mm. And like I said, I was very perturbed, and I took offense to it, and uh, I didn't, I wasn't prepared how to how to answer that. So that was interesting. I have, a, yeah. I have a better idea now. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, I can I can relate to that. I think most parents can. You know, you're, you're, it's always this this kind of duality between between you're, you're torn between you want your children to fit into society's rules, but at the same time, accept that society's rules do not really fit young children. And right. I, as as time has got on got on for me, certainly, I've become. Yeah, you know, far more laissez-faire about actually how my children behave in public and my focus is on whether they are having a good time provided they're not hurting anyone and find they're not causing any harm um, right right yeah the, if he was the, hitting the, somebody the opinions or... of others are, aren't a concern to me but there was definitely a time and I can very much relate to that and feel your pain because certainly when when my youngest was a lot younger and I was I was quite new to parenting when I I think I was parenting by um the opinions of others and wanting to make sure that you know, he wasn't making noise and he wasn't being disturbed and being very apologetic i mean that's a that's a very british trait that is for us to right. apologize yeah, all the time that. um but no i i think you know ultimately you have to focus on what's right for your child obviously if your child right. is misbehaving in a way that's causing you know significant other people's discomfort. discomfort to others then there's a conversation there but it's not again it's not to say that the child is necessarily right. being naughty it's just that they do not understand right. how they're supposed to behave in that situation it's a very it's a very hard balance to struggle to, to, to exactly. reach i think exactly yes i totally agree mm. um and what was i thinking um we we're talking about at Kind of aspects of parenting that maybe caught you by surprise right so that was one i think um i mean i was a teacher so i have quite a bit experience with 
children and their behaviors and their and, and ways to deal with it. I don't have extensive experience with younger younger children, uh, toddler age. I found babies to be actually easy. Mm. <laughs> but toddlers, <didn't> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean even later, you know, uh, when they start to walk and um, I don't know. It, well, I did get I did get COVID, um, not hospitalized, but I was quite severe and being a single parent not being able to have someone come over and take care of him um you know it was a week more than a week of, of illness mm. and so that was stressful um but uh, we got through it and luckily he wasn't a toddler i think that would have made it a whole lot more. <laughs> absolutely it's, it's definitely a stage um i'm still in the midst of that stage um it does slowly get it's a bit easier sure. but it's <laughs> and i knew i wasn't gonna particularly like it i don't no. think anybody likes it but um i think i probably could have prepared for it a little bit better um because like i said i i was i wasn't the kind of parent to um, read a lot of books about infants you know and how to take care of them i kind of did as i need to Mm. It was kind of a need to know basis. So it worked out very well. I was super happy with that. But I think the toddler part uh, needs a little bit of forethought. <laughs> possibly, possibly. Yeah. Although I'm not sure I was prepared either, either, either time. So you, you're <laughs> not alone in that. So, okay. so tell me, tell me um, so you've mentioned you were a, you were a kindergarten teacher for, for many years um, prior to starting up Rainbow Life. Um, yeah. What what skills do you think you picked up as a teacher of very young children that are helping you to help others today and to help and to help you as a parent? Yeah, so um, I was thinking parent first. Uh, very helpful um, for for becoming a parent to be a teacher and then to become a parent. Super helpful. <laughs> um, it's kind of I hate to say it this way, but it's kind of um, you learn from others' mistakes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think you see a lot of kids and a lot of parents and a lot of their interactions, um, and you see the outcomes um, without being in the middle of it. So you get to be the observer, and it's very helpful. Um, so that was a huge help. Um, as far as my business, I think it's Teaching, you have to be very organized, um, so that was helpful. You have to be creative, that's very helpful. Um, you have to be flexible, that's very helpful. <laughs> A lot of those issues um, allow for business. However, um, when when you have a classroom, you're you're kind of um, I don't know you're especially of younger children, you're more, I hate to use the word control, but I think it kind of fits. You're in control. You you have to be in control. You're going to have a bunch of kids running around doing mm. nothing. <laughs> um, so in business, it's not really like that. You know, you can't, you can't run your business like a classroom in that sense. Uh, so that did not help. But uh, yeah, organizing, um, creativity, and compassion. I mean, uh, being a teacher, you have to be compassionate. Uh, you know, and if you weren't going in, you became compassionate. <laughs> um, sure. So in surrogacy, uh, in particular, you have to be very compassionate. It's very difficult for people. Um, and you have to really understand where they are. and. Also, you know, even for the surrogate who is who is giving of themselves, uh, uh, you have to you have to see it from their point of view as well. And as an agent, you know, just like if you were to buy a house, you know, an agent is the person who helps the seller and the buyer. So you have the two ends. Um, and if there's issues that come up, you have to be the one that that helps them through it. And that's really one a big part of our job. So, so what exactly 
is the process then to become a a surrogate in in New York State? Who who is eligible? Good question. So um, so we could start with age. Age is set by the uh, IVF uh, guidelines. Um, and they're a little bit softer than some people think, like, you know, you'll see age requirements like 40 or 22 to 42 would be like an example you would see. And it's a bit softer because um, there's a lot of factors involved. So you have to be healthy. You have to have had healthy pregnancies, mm -hmm. healthy delivery, and a healthy postpartum. So some people don't develop issues until after uh, they give birth. So all three parts of pregnancy have to be what we call uncomplicated. So that's very important because that's a good indicator of future pregnancies because the whole idea is to mitigate any um, uh, difficulties or you know compli complications. Uh, so that's a huge part. So once they are you know the right age range and the right health. Um, they have to be, for New York State, they have to live in New York State. Um, and right now, they're working on the parent side. The parents have to be New York residents, but they're um, changing that law. And there are some people who have successfully come from outside of New York State. That's a separate issue. <laughs> um, they have to go through um, mental health evaluation. Um, they have to answer a lot of questions. Um, part of matching to the right person is understanding um, even things that a surrogate maybe had not thought of before. Um, I'm trying to think of an example that I wouldn't know. Um, like, would you be interested in being a parent or um, being a surrogate to a par older parent, right? Do you have an age range you're interested in? Um, so if I was to present you with a 55-year-old parent, would that be okay? So there's a lot of things to think, that you need to think about before you go into being a surrogate. And we help you through all of that. Um, let's see what else. We do background checks, of course, you know, um, criminal, um, financial. Uh, part of our job is to make sure that they're not being financially manipulated. Um, in other words, somebody is encouraging them to be a surrogate so that they would become um, enriched by the money. Um, you know, it has to be a, a choice of their own, you know, uh, cognition, you know, their own, their own choice. They can't be manipulated by the idea of the money or, or by some other person involved, uh, which is part of the mental health part. We'll get into that. Um, see what other factors? Um, there's, you know, drug screenings. There, there's, there's a lot of screening involved. Mm. I'm interested. I mean, are, are, there, are there kind of common threads that you've picked up through this work in terms of the motivating factors for people to become a surrogate? Uh, say that again. So I'm interested by what motivates someone to become a surrogate parent, yeah. because it's an, it's an incredible thing to do. And I know that there is obviously a financial element to it, right. but it's, you know, it's not it's not exactly the easiest way to earn money so i'm sure that's yes. not the driver what 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 are what tend to be the motivators why do people do it are these people that generally already have children of their own and have what um, i want to kind of give back to couples that are or, or individuals that are unable to have children is that the main reason right right so i would say the main reason is usually someone has a surrogate has not personal experience, but has known somebody that had difficulty having children. I think that is probably the biggest reason. And the next would be, you know, the type of person that is um, very caring in general, you know, be 
before they even approach surrogacy. Like I've heard um, a lot of nurses, there's a nurse, nurses are common in surrogacy. Um, uh, so it, it usually a kind person, they're usually empathetic to the whole infertility issue. Um, and they're, you know, it's, it's a scale. It's a, it's a, it's a gray scale of, you know, empathy and finance. And you, you typically want to avoid someone who is doing it for purely financial reasons, because that means they haven't thought through uh, a lot of the issues. Um, and I don't know if you would want to avoid someone on the other side. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything wrong with somebody being purely empathetic. Um, but there is a there is a grayscale. So it, people fall somewhere in the middle. Um, so having the financial option is very helpful um, because, you know, a lot of people make good choices in their life. And sometimes they get in financial difficulty, you know, and not realizing it. And so I, I definitely understand because surrogates not only have their life changed by seeing someone else having their own child, yeah. which I'm sure is quite touching for them as well. Um, but they also change their own lives a little bit with the money, you know, they could get a down payment on a new house or buy a new car or um, pay off debt that you know has been a burden for quite a few years. So the financial part is is helpful. Um, it is it is a factor. But um, you, you definitely find more people in the empathetic realm. So how does your um, obviously you've experienced it from the side of becoming a father through surrogacy does that help your conversation with um prospective surrogate parents to to kind of give them the i guess an idea of what it's like on the other side as someone who's gone through the process yeah. does that help you yes and especially someone um who went through the long version of it <laughs> mm. and running into a lot of the the possible uh challenges that come up in the surrogacy journey so definitely helpful when talking to parents and even surrogates as well. I like to, to share with surrogates challenges that um, happen in the journey in general and with the parents um, on the parent side. Um, I also felt more I'm able to speak to parents better about the, the infertility part, um, the part about not having a child. I think that's as important uh, and the journey itself is where you've been well it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a grief process isn't it i know that's it we've, we work through that it's it's a it's a long period of grieving for for a, for an absence a child and you need voice. validation from mm. other people that understand it you need support groups that are super helpful for people that don't have parents now for people like me where you know it's because you're a single parent uh single male, male parent um there's not a lot of support groups. I did run into one. Uh, it's called Men Having Babies. That was a, uh, it's an online forum, um, but still very helpful because I was able to at least express similar feelings that other other men had. Um, but uh, families going through infertility, there's a lot of options out there, and I highly encourage you know no matter if they're going through surrogacy or not that they they look into that because it is. As we mentioned before, it's isolating. It's uh, you feel ostracized sometimes from normal social uh, situations and um, depression. Yeah, and it it takes a it takes a tremendous toll on the relationship. It takes a tremendous toll on you as individuals. It's um, it's hard. It's hard, and and I would I would echo that. But any support you can get from from others going through a similar situation is is invaluable it really is um i, I i'm interested you it was obviously 
no, there's no doubt many emotional ups and downs that go along the surrogacy journey like there is with with any pregnancy yeah any kind but, it's of that, but it's obviously that extra level to to to, to yeah. get there in the first place um so so how are you supporting through rainbow life how are you helping aspiring parents along their personal pathways um well like i mentioned when when you first have that both first consultation um when they're seeking information from you about your agency and about surrogacy in general um i do take that time to uh, connect with them on that pain that you that that place that they don't you know, normally talk to other people about um, so i think that's comforting for them um, and i also help them understand other issues um, i had one parent want to do uh, what's called a double embryo transfer basically they are looking to have two children fraternal twins at one time and our agency uh, i decided not to do that um so there's uh, some education involved some difficult you know discussions that you have to have um you know i explained why and uh but yeah supporting i think it helps to have been there for sure um we definitely encourage them to it's not required but they can have access to um, a mental health professional uh, the same one that they because parents have to be um it's not screening really it's um i don't know how to explain it we've been <laughs> those in the surrogacy field have been trying to think of a word that explains it better. <laughs> we haven't come up with one yet. <laughs> um, but they, they basically, they, it's the hard conversations, you know, and where, how you're feeling at the moment, how would you feel if this happened? You know, they walk you through a lot. So they have access to that person um, after the initial um, meeting, let's say. Sure. So you're about um, about 18 months into the, the journey of, of Rainbow Life. Is that about right as we record this? Um, I would say a little bit less because I got my license about um, actually more, a little bit, almost a year ago, or well, a little more than a year ago. Um, but I didn't start right away. I didn't want I didn't want to start before I had my license. Some some agencies decided to do that, that they would just start before they got their license and expecting to take a license. Um, I felt I wanted to be more prepared, um, you know, documentation wise, thinking out possibilities and procedures and you know difficulties, um, you know, marketing. I wanted to get my name out there first. Um, so I would say probably about a year. Yeah. Okay. So what what are your what are your hopes? Obviously, you're, you're it's still very early in that business journey, but where would you like to see Rainbow Life go? Like maybe in in three to five years' time, what would be the dream for you from here? Lots of babies. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. I. I love that question because um, I think I'm different in that respect. I am a small business. I'm a family run business. Um, I'm a family focused business. I am not a business focused business. And a lot of people in the business area don't like that. They think that's a, a, a recipe for failure. Um, but my focus is to stay small, to stay personable, to stay family uh, focused and give that true one-on-one, -on -one, I know where you've been and I know where you're going and I wanna help you. And if I don't know everybody by, by name and by likes and personality, 
then I have too many. Um, so I would like to stay small. I might hire somebody to help with the, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, but I don't have an aspiration to have Rainbow Life become large. Um, there's quite a few agencies that have taken that they've done. So um, I would say lots of babies, but not too many, helping a lot of people, um, finding great people along the way, especially surrogates. I think they have a huge story to tell um, through their experience. Uh, yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for recognizing your business's mission and that growth doesn't have to be part of that i yeah. i think it's a real misnomer within any business and sector that you have to grow to succeed i think it's it's fine to be a specialist in an area to stay small and to deliver a very personal do, service in the long term it is do awesome work <laughs> yeah it's something that's sprung up isn't it in the in the last few decades really this this drive to grow 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 and your business can't stay still it has to always get bigger and bigger and um i, I think I'm in the sure us I... it's been that way for quite a bit <laughs> yes and i think it's probably the us creeping over into into all the markets it's, it's big it's... big big yeah but but i but there's something to be said for small local independent yeah, call me mom and pop. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was just thinking about it. It's, it's, the, it's the digital it's just you know, the pop shop. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> pop shop. I love that. Um, so what, what I'd love to know, I'm sure there'll be people that are listening today who are um you know, either struggling with infertility, may have considered surrogacy as a route to becoming a parent, or or may have also considered um serving as a, a surrogate themselves to others. Are there any resources or practical tips um recommended reading and any kind of things that you found valuable over the years that you might recommend as a as a as a starting point yeah good question um because it is it is quite daunting in the beginning there's a lot of acronyms um there's a lot of parts to it um hmm I didn't start with a book per se, so I'm not that kind of person where I want to read a lot about something. Um, I would say the internet is definitely a good resource, although it can lead you down rabbit holes sometimes. So stick with the more reliable sources, you know. Um, let's see. Definitely, you know, um, talk to people. Um, you never know, like, surrogacy was not in my view at all, uh, when, even at near the end, where I was all, pretty much ready to give up, uh, I had talked to somebody, and they're the ones that brought it up to me, uh, and I was like, well, I thought, like, you know, movie stars did that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think talking to people and you know you don't have to talk to them about um, all your deepest you know darkest moments and challenges but talk to them in general tell them your story you never know you're who you're going to run into uh, uh, oftentimes um well I won't I won't say it's the majority but um, there's plenty of times where um a couple or uh, you know, a gay couple or a single person tell somebody their story and they're like, oh, I could, I would love to be an egg donor for you, or I would be a surrogate for you. However, I do suggest you be careful before blurting those things out, because that had happened to me, I think, a couple times, and I got super excited and then found out that either you know they couldn't be one uh, or they changed their minds and didn't bring it up again it's, it's very um it's a stressful uh, element on a on a on a uh, relationship mm. so you want to be careful if you bring that up but uh, as a person in need of becoming a parent i would suggest sharing your story is important i think there's more resources than you know around you 
and and if if they can't help you directly, then they can help you indirectly. You know, I think it's important. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, I did have the forum, so there's plenty of um, Facebook groups. Uh, you know, it used to be message boards, but now it's uh, usually Facebook Facebook groups um, that you can definitely reach out and just kind of sit there and watch and listen. Um, you know, when people ask questions about surrogacy, we never thought of that question. So mm. you can learn a lot just by watching other people uh, go through their journey that, you know, they're a little further ahead than you. Uh, so that would probably be my suggestion. Um, talk to people you know and reach out to people who are in similar situations and maybe further along. Because you don't want to go too far ahead. That's the, yeah. that's the, the challenge. You know, you, you want to get to the end uh, but it's not going to help you. You need to know where you are and embrace, you know, those challenges that you have immediately in front of you. There's, there's one other question that I was interested to talk to you about. So you, you mentioned to me that um, obviously you've lived in, a, in New York State for a long time and you had not only the the COVID-19 pandemic and that, that global event that, that was a big life trigger for your life changing trigger but also of yeah. course you um you know you, you lived through 9 11 um and the yeah. impact of that on new york and i understand my right in saying that that had quite an impact in terms of your your career and your life trajectory at that time as well yeah again i think it's similar for a lot of people um you know more so obviously for 9 11 in the u.s and, and even those of us in new york state um I just brought up a memory. Mm. I have a a cousin who who worked in the trade center, and fortunately, you know, cut to the chase. She she did not go to work early that day, and um, and survived. Okay. Um, so I we have a close connection to that. There's so many stories like that, aren't there? That you've but we've heard over yeah. the years of of missed connections or a, a last minute phone call taken or something yep. that so many people that were so close and it's funny i remember that day um and it's part of her story as well it was a gorgeous day it was actually very much like today not a cloud in the sky the sky was super blue um it was not humid at all we get humid here in new york um you know, September is sort of the switch over. You get that nice fall weather. It's just breezy. It's the best time of year. Um, and she just took her time to talk to her neighbor that day. And it changed her life. Mm. She still can't go down downtown. Um, it's hard for her. Mm. And so anyway, as far as it relates to me, <laughs> I worked... That's at that time I was working for the um, the global corporate um, business I won't name, and uh, I worked in software. So I worked a lot in inside um, at a desk, you know, with walls, not really windows. And we the the company has separate companies under them all over the United States. So we would fly a lot. Uh, to different places. Um, I was in research, so we weren't attached to one of the companies. So we would go to different companies. And that moment sitting in the cubicle, um, there was no TVs at work. Um, and internet was super young. There was no streaming video yet. I think you could watch little teeny tiny clips, um, but there was paper headlines, but they weren't usually up to date very quick like they are today um and i believe i found out through a co-worker whose wife had called them because they were watching it on tv and i was like you don't have a frame of reference mm -hmm. it's very bizarre mm -hmm. so somebody said a plane had run into the building and i'm like that has happened before not common but you know planes crash 
um, due to malfunction or you know other reasons and and then I had dismissed it I'm like you know I guess I'll read about it later and and then the second one happened and that's when everybody at work just stopped um and it wasn't at that moment but soon after I was thinking you know a, do I want to be flying in planes for someone else's financial benefit? No. <laughs> do I want to spend my days in a cubicle um, working on software uh, for the rest of my life? No. So it was definitely a turning point. Um, just very similar to COVID, where you, although you didn't have the time to think about it. Um, but it was very, uh, a very moving moment where you needed to think about what was going on in your own life. Um, so that's when I decided to go back to teaching. So I had actually not taught out of college. Uh, it's something I went back to. Um, and it was, it was to fill that original um, desire to help others. Um, I love teaching as far as um, showing people new things, you know, and the, yeah. the amazement of, of new information and, and how much is out there, and all that geeky stuff. <laughs> 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 so yeah, 9-11 was a huge impact on my life um, and, the co and COVID was also a huge impact on my life. Mm. I don't know if I'm, I'm susceptible to that. <laughs> Um, I don't, or I don't know if other people have similar experiences. I, I think um, if you're more tend into being impacted by large events, I think if you're empathetic towards others and you're wired in that kind of way, then I think periods of national or international distress are challenging. I mean, we've yeah, just, think, you know, been right. through it. We've just been through it in the UK with, you know, the passing of, 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 of our queen, and um, I think that's affected a lot of people very deeply, mm. rooted, rooted in a national identity, and, and obviously, not an event that's not a surprise, as such. Right. But um, that just feeling of loss, and that it's just a strange, unsettling feeling, and, and when big big events like that happen they just rock the the, the the very root of you really the essence of who you are for a mm -hmm. bit and it is I think sometimes during those times of great unsettlement that actually mm -hmm. that is where inspiration can emerge because actually it's very easy to become complacent in when all your days are the norm and all your days are safe and routine Right. You settle, but when everything's thrown on its head, as it as it has been, um, you know, twice twice for you um, with those big events, I think they're you know these are opportunities to 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 reevaluate. I would agree with that. Um, I'm definitely empathetic, uh, and I think also on top of what you said, I think you absorb the feelings of all those other people going through that, and it and it and it. It weighs you down. You can feel it, you know. So I think you're right. I think it kind of turns you into a turtle, and you kind of slow down. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's really, you know, inspiring. I'm. I'm so happy that you've been able to turn that experience on its head. Not. Not be a turtle and um you know actually start <laughs> for a little to, while i was a turtle yeah that's that's fine we all go through that stage but I, i'm really happy that you've been able to turn it around to to build this business with purpose very much at its heart and to be you know taking the, the, the you know the very tough and challenging experience that you've had to provide um comfort and support to others i'm i'm sure there'll be lots of people listening today who would like to know more about rainbow life so here is your opportunity to plug george um where can our listeners find out more about you and keep up to date who should they follow what's your website sure um so my website is rainbowlifeagency.com um somebody took rainbow life <laughs> <laughs> so 
Um, and you can follow me pretty much everywhere. I'm on uh, LinkedIn uh, at George Ryan and also Rainbow Life and uh, Facebook and Instagram. And I have a couple videos on TikTok, but I haven't quite caught on yet. Um, and I'm looking at Twitter, of course. Rainbow Life Agent, I think. I had to shorten it. <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty much available on any social media. Brilliant. Well, I'm I'm sure um, various social platforms in particular will be a great way for you to build those connections, provide advice and signpost people towards um, the, the journey of, of surrogacy. So um, just want to say thank you so much for your time, for your honesty and your openness today. It's been so nice to speak with you um, on a personal level. It's been lovely to, to reconnect. We first met in in the States best part of 20 years ago. So it's many years ago, many years ago uh, when I still had long, luxurious flowing hair. So it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's lovely to have a chance to do this. So thank you, George. Um, so that, that wraps us up for, for today. Um, my guest today, George Ryan, the founder of, of Rainbow Life. Um, I've been your host, Ben Veal, the founder of Second Mountain Comms. And this has been the Good Journeys with Second Mountain podcast. So until next time, let's keep climbing together and see you all again soon.